I have a number of people here that can answer in depth about a lot of different aspects of the company and our product. I have, of course, Giorgio Guarini here himself uh, that can discuss anything about what we do in production, how we produce. If you ever want to know anything about the Italian market, for example, the firearm industry, you're talking to one of the absolute wealths and information that you really can't do a whole lot better. His family's been in for generations. That's a very high well, I mean, he can tell you almost anything you ever wanted, if you ever, you know, any question you wanted to know about guns, but we're afraid to ask. So he can tell you. I've got Tom Smith, my sales manager. i got Andrew Wurtenberger there, who is our, our head of our gunsmithing and, and custom shop. He can tell you anything about that aspect of it. i got Sean here from marketing. i got Lynn right back here, who is our brand manager for Siren. And we'll talk a little bit about that, because that's been extraordinary. Um, and show you the new product as it relates to sirens. And we got all the good Orbis people back here, which we have had probably now, uh, how many years? 12? Something like that? 12 year, very close relationship uh, with Orbis. And uh, um, in my humble opinion, that it's been great uh, working with them. I consider everyone there my friend. So, um, down the line, if you have any other questions or thoughts about it, you can address any one of these people. So, Cesar Marini. Cesar Guarini um, was started uh, literally from scratch, from nothing. Uh, the trademark was deposited in February 2001. Correct? Exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> that gives you an idea. So the was founded in December 2000. Yeah, okay. So the, uh, yeah, December 2000, the uh, trademark was deposited with the proof house. Uh, February 2001, production of guns started after that. And um, I like to tell people when they ask you a question, or even when they don't, because I run my math a lot, is why or how did you start? And, and I guess you get to a point in your life where you're just smart enough to figure <laughs> it out, but just young and dumb enough to try, kind of that thing, you know? And so we thought about that. You have this, this moment. You know, where you're contemplating where you're going to go and what you're going to do. And, um, you, you know, am I going to lose all my money that I got? My little bit of savings, am I going to lose it? You know, the Giorgio's, you know, going into debt, I'm going into debt. You know, what's the worst that's going to happen? Well, they can't kill you. They can take all your money, but they can't kill you. And if we try and fail, I would feel much better at the end of the day than if we never had the nerve to try to begin with. So... We started that company in uh, beginning, you know, 2001, 2000, technically on paper, um, and uh, in a rented factory building uh, with very modest production. We had some help from vendors all over the Italian industry because Giorgio, and the person we are leaving out here, which I think is in here, is his brother Antonio. <laughs> Antonio is an absolutely gifted engineer, and. Um, so the, the team works very, very well together. Uh, we all have kind of a, a, a slightly different expertise um, in, in what we do, but collectively, it's a pretty good management team in, in running the company. Um, what year did we start building the factory? 2007. Okay, 2007. 2006, we started. 2007. The first new factory building in the Gardone Valtrampia Valley in how many years, Georgia? 50? 45. 45 years. Yeah, 45 years. Born some small company, not in industrial way for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah okay. In industrial way, in Europe, the second uh, company older than us uh, is Blasa. Stop. Yeah. So, um, in this valley, matter of fact, to the point where there's so much little, there's, the valley's so small, for anyone that's been there, you're familiar with how small it is. There's so little real estate that physically finding space to put a factory was a bit difficult. So we are in the very top of the valley. You can't go any further in the valley. We're at the very, very top. The back of the building's on one side of the hill. There's a parking lot, the road, and on the other side of the road is the other side of the hill. There with a bad arm, you can hit it with a rock. I mean, so that's it. We're at the top of the valley. That's the, uh, uh, there's uh, two buildings we have uh, that comprise about uh, 2,500 square meters. So that equates to, I don't know, 
total production uh, floor space between the two companies is about 140,000 square feet of, of production floor space. Not that that matters a whole lot, but so it's 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 fairly fairly substantial size. Um, we have uh, in the process. It's a, it's a great facility, the most state of the art facility because it's the newest facility. <laughs> you know, you don't go buy new old equipment to put in new factories. Um, but uh, as far as technology goes, and this is the one thing we'll touch on when we get to the revenue, is I know a lot of people here might have a real affinity for the, the romance of making things by hand and bespoke and custom made. And I'll talk a little bit more about where the future is and where we see the future is going. If you like that, we're not your cup of tea, okay? Because we touch very little in the production of a gun. <clears throat> All right. So if you are are just steeped in the romance uh, of you know building a shotgun out of a block of steel with a file and, and a smoke lamp, we're we're definitively not your company because one of the part of the the story These here. These are the two only operation we touch with the. That's file. it. Yep. That's why the photo. That's adjusting the action tension. Yep. And so they're not allowed to alter a part. They're not allowed to fit something to something else. The, the, the product has to come together. Georgia can give you a very detailed explanation of how we've automated everything. You see that thing? It looks like a uh, coning tower for the control tower for an a, a, um, aircraft carrier. That's a part of an automated system. Everything's barcoded, parts control, guns, security. Just everything is, is literally state of the art. But one of the advantages of being uh, investing all the capital in a brand new factory is also that we have brand new equipment. And as such, we have a capability in our production tolerances that you wouldn't be able to enjoy if you have 20 year old, 10 year old, 20 year old, 30 year old equipment, or in a lot of cases in the valley, 50 year or 60 year old equipment. Some of the tolerances on the machines that you are looking at hold one ten thousandths. Well, we don't need them to hold that all the time, but the capabilities of the machines are down to one ten thousandths. So, um, you can rub that inch off. Inch or meter. Huh? Inch or millimeter. Inch. Um, so the precision that we can manufacture to uh, is important. We build a gun, okay, that's a classic design over and under. We don't have, uh, you know, a floating breech block or anything like that. So in a, a standard conventional over and under or side by side, uh, you need to have either extreme tolerances uh, to be able to have it come together without monkeying with it, or you have to break out the files and hand fit everything. And we are the not the latter. We're the, the we're the you're not allowed to touch it. Antonio will come out and hit you with a stick if he sees you with a file or messing around with something you're not supposed to mess around. With. That's uh, that, yeah. So the one last thing that they do touch is just the, and we do when we put on a new barrel as well, is the barrel lug, just to set the tension. We got to be very, very careful because it's a, it's a fine line on how you do that. Some people it's too stiff for, some people it's not stiff enough. So um, that would be the only thing. So um, in uh, 2000 was the first year we acquired. 2010, the first step. In 2007, are you talking about the fire? Yeah. Yeah. So in 2007, we Make sure you came right. inside of the new building, but after a few years, we understood immediately that yeah. it was not enough. Yeah. We have to invest a number, another, another big number of money for, for, for in, in, increase the production capacity. And so the idea was right. invest in, uh, again in that company or to have a great opportunity to... So the year 2010? 2010. 2010 I'll just make sure I get the date right. So in yeah. 2010, one of, of our vendors, sense. which we had a good personal relationship with, which was Fab Arms, which a, a lot of people in the U.S. are not terribly familiar with Fab Arm, um, other than they made a, uh, a, a few products that were branded under uh, other names, H&K. They imported a lot of guns that are H&K for a run of years. Um, there is a little dabbling here and there, but here's a company that is really only second to the Beretta group, just Fabarm, and um, is in 52 countries of distribution, 
but not the U.S. <laughs> so they mastered everything else but the biggest market. And this facility, which is three stories, uh, in the, the Cesar Greeny was like he said, it, it, Georgia was saying is either we had to figure out how to make a bigger factory or we needed to acquire uh, more production capabilities. And Fat Barn being a, which is not in the valley, it's outside of the valley, it's about a 45 minute ride. It's in Brescia, but it's in an South indu industrial South park. Um, because there was, at the, even at the time that this factory was built, the Fat Barn factory was built, there wasn't the room to build it in the valley. So, um, and what's more, have a, a unique company with the production, battle production side. Yeah, yeah. Because so, this is another important thing. Right. All right. And, and um, so, in 2010, we acquired uh, uh, a, a stake in the company, uh, approximately 50 percent, and then I think it was two years afterwards. Four years. Four, four years afterwards. I mean, my dates are all it all blends together. Um, four years afterwards, we acquired the rest of the company. So collectively, and the, the, the buildings, uh, the three buildings for production uh, at Fabarm are 10,000 square meters. Um, the the, um, the Fabarm company, just to give a little backstory on the Fabarm company, Barrow. is actually uh, in Barrow Production, I'll <laughs> uh, The Fabarm company is uh, started production of firearms, started off as a gunsmithing, like a lot of things over in Italy, um, for 1900, and the name of it was <coughs> Luciano the Galesi family. The Galesi family. Is it long time? It was a, a long time gunsmithing, pretty big deal, but at gunsmithing, not manufacturing. 1900 they started. In 1900 they started producing uh, semi-automatic pistol and over and under. I mean, side by side shotguns. In the 19... Semi-auto. Semi-auto. Right, boss. I got you. Semi-auto, right, a little bit late. It's right. So, um, and then they went into semi-automatic shotguns, which was a big component of their business, uh, long recoil action, and the year... 60. In 1960. First week, uh, long recoil. And um, today... Golden Matic. <laughs> <laughs> the Golden Matic. Um, <laughs> marketing genius. <laughs> uh, so today we make semi-automatics, a number of different configurations, both uh, 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 gas-operated systems, inertia systems. We make uh, pump shotguns, we make over and under shotguns, we make side-by-side -side shotguns, we make bulk action rifles, we make double rifles. Um, we make we're in a number of different markets. We're in military, law enforcement, commercial, obviously, or, or and uh, sporting. Uh, so w pretty varied product portfolio. The emphasis is on shotguns, obviously. Uh, that's where our bread and butter is, and our expertise is in shotguns. Um, and we have the capability, in general, uh, of making a product that is very competitive where Caesar Greeny is meant to be a little bit different thing. So talking about the position of the product real quickly so you get the whole picture <coughs> and the strategy. Caesar Greeny falls and, and was always our vision to fall between kind of mass produced product in double guns and the semi semi production guns. So guns that are, are you know, maybe just say start at 10,000 and up and uh, guns that are um, the next level that a consumer might look to go into after they were at that, you know, base Satori or 680 series, as an example, right? So what's that individual? Because there's always been a big gap there, right? Between those two, two really, that it's always existed a, a pretty big price gap. And our vision was that if we could really make a gun that was very mechanically engineering, durability, uh, on a technical side, very competent gun, but do and incorporate in a lot of the, the very traditional, beautiful, bespoke gun features through technology that we would have a great position in between. And do it, try to, you know, in the process, try to do a little of everything better. You know, do customer service, which is a big component of what we do. Uh, we're the first ones, you know, that are, are really pushing the whole, a whole like, pretty extreme package of customer service. Lifetime warranty, free tune-ups, and customers are getting so dubious of all it, they say, well, they get free tune-ups because their guns break. 
No, we just get freaking us because we're trying to be good guys, you know. And so, um, customer service it, it is a big component of it as well. So, FabArm, what FabArm does is FabArm, we make a gun that's more, uh, where we're very traditional in Caesar Greeny, is, is very more, much more aimed at a contemporary market, uh, not unlike a lot of guns on the market today. Um, cleaner aesthetic, uh, very, very technically solid, and we've improved that even a lot since we acquired the company. Antonio, we've expanded our engineering capabilities, and the product before 2010 is vastly better now, so, uh, in my opinion. And, and so uh, the product has come along, uh, but because of the size of production and the efficiencies, we can make products that are pretty darn competitive at, there's a certain price level you just can't really honestly get below and still have quality, mm -hmm. but we're at about a, as efficient as any company gets at FabArm, and our base prices would start at 2400 or so MSRP. Um, Am I right on that, Tom? Yeah. Yeah. I've got so many numbers hit. But um, that's, if you're talking about a gun made not in a third world country, that's about as cheap as you can make one and keep a, a reasonable margin in. So you can do things like this that we're doing today. If you're trying to go under 2000 and sell a gun made uh, in that level, those are margins are so thin that it's not typically very sustainable. And one of the things to rationalize when you think about that, right? So if you think about a Satori or a 680 series, for example, just, just to give you an idea, I'm not picking on them, but just as an example, every year your cost of production goes up three to five percent. All right? So if you want to know where margins are shrinking or quality is being extracted to, to, to keep your production costs in line, any product that hasn't gone up three to five percent every year, they're losing something. They're going backwards somewhere. They're either taking cost out of it or they're taking margin out of it. But every year, the insurance company, the electric bill, the taxes, the everything, all of it goes, all, we all know that. We all get charged more every year. So it's, a, it's irrational that a gun can remain the same for 10 years. Something's gonna change. It speaks for itself. These are just production realities, right? So we have very competitive products. Um, we're not willing to cut down to say we're going to match all their prices, but we're so close that anyone can make a rational decision to say that's worth three hundred dollars more, or that worth is worth four hundred dollars, or that's worth two hundred dollars more. And so we're very competitive with FabArm with those production production guns. And um, our quality today, you can judge for yourself, but our quality today compared, or like our over under quality in that price range, is extremely competitive. I don't want to, you know, but you make your judgment yourself. But where there are no sacrifices in any fab arm double gun we make. So in other words, we don't cut any cost out of the gun for any particular aspect whatsoever. All right? So there's no fit and finish. You know, uh, there's no um, uh, finishing processes that we use to take cost out. That's as, that's as efficient as we can make it without any sacrifices. And that's Fowler and today. Okay. The third, it's not a factory, but the third brand uh, that I would wanted to talk about, and, and Lynn can answer a lot more questions for you today, is Siren. Um, and I'm going to uh, bear with me because I'm going to tell you the story of how, in my mind, Siren came about. And you know, being an active shooter, and I don't shoot as much as I used to, but, you know, I, I, I used to see women coming out to, to events and shooting and actively shooting, but the numbers have always been small, okay? And manufacturers have been grappling with half of the population by saying, we can't invest, because I've been on the inside, I've been part of these conversations. You can't invest in the women's market because the market's not there. So they're not of the belief that if you make it, they'll come, that... We're just not going to recoup our, our, our investments in, in producing women-specific products, right? And so for, for forever, that's how it's been, from caveman days pretty much, right? And uh, guilty as anybody about that. And the worst, the worst part about it, and you talk to any lady in the audience here, is the, what we call the pink it and shrink it, right? 
So paint it pink or offer them a youth model and that's going to be good enough. That's as much as we're willing to go here because we don't want to invest the cost or, or, or really step out on the limb here. And so that's always been the approach with it. What changed my mind? What made me a convert in, in the process? What made me a convert actually is my wife who hates, didn't want to shoot. Went to sporting play tournaments with me all the time. Didn't want to shoot? That's fair enough. But she loved going. She liked doing it. She went to a, um, a uh, charity shoot or benefit shoot for uh, uh, the school my kids are in. And uh, it was a really nice fair. And she shot with some of her friends and she loved it. So outside of being offended, I thought that was pretty amazing <laughs> because all at once... She was enjoying the experience, you know, so I'm thinking about that for a little while. So the next thing I do is I grab a gun, demo gun, take a stock that's already been messed up or something. I'm going to whack that down. I'm going to fit it to her because I know she may not shoot much, but I'm going to go ahead and fit her to one of our guns. So we take a, an existing gun and kind of get it together and we measure her up, give her a fitting, cut it down, hand it to her. And she's picking it up and holding it and I'm adjusting it, no, hold it this way and looking at it, look at it. And like a light bulb came on, I said, this is crap. This is no good. If I had to shoot that gun, I would be really unhappy. If I had a gun that fit me that way. And that's the moment that cemented the fact that there was no way to get from point A, a gun for me, to point B, a gun for Lynn. You can't make it out of the same, same dimensions. You just can't do it that way. You got to... So at that point, I realized immediately that you have to be all in. You have to be dedicated to it. Another interesting step that happened all about the same time, and it happened up at Orvis, at San Denona. Got the tent game fair scenario with the tents. My wife loves to go to this one event. And bring, we bring the kids up, and she's shopped around all the tents, and she's sitting in the back of ours reading a book in a folding chair. And I was there with one of our reps, and three times that weekend, a woman snuck around us, and I mean snuck around us, tiptoed around us, kind of casually, went back to my wife, who was reading a book in the corner, and said, do you work here? You know, she goes, well, yeah, kind of. I'm the supreme leader. <laughs> you know? So, you know, and, and she said to me, this is three of them, three people went and came back here. And she, you know, helped them out, and then she brought them over, because she didn't know that much, and we opened up a conversation, they learned that we were not going to be intimidating or bite about it, but it, it's also thinking about the, the experience, the consumer experience for women in the firearm business. And you really start putting it into the context. These guys, we don't even understand it really. We experience it on small little chunks from time to time. Our, our meeting here a little bit, I talked about, uh, I alluded to about where we think you know, the market is going and where it's changing, right? And to that end, um, you can see it in the Valley, which is still one of the few centralized manufacturing, firearm manufacturing uh, regions in, in the world. Most of it has become decentralized, right? And everyone has to internalize their production, and like the U.S. and everywhere else. But this is one of the places where it's still all kind of encapsulated in one place. But the culture's going away, clearly. Okay, so for example, you'll see pictures of barrel regulators over there looking at it. Uh, at one time, a few years ago, Georgia told me there's about seven guys in the whole valley that are good barrel regulation people. Seven. And it takes you how many years to become a really good... A lot of years. Yeah. A and lot of years. And, and, so they want to go to Milan and they want to go into the high tech and fashion business. Or whatever after it is. many years, they're not able to Right. It's a cultural <laughs> shift. And it's, right. So we're losing them. That. So as much as you might think, you know, a, a um, completely handmade gun is wonderful, and it is in every way, a, as a piece of artwork and as a piece of craftsmanship, it's unlikely that we'll retain that ability to be able to make something completely by hand or close to uh, by hand going into the future. That, that is what it is. Not only that, but because it's so exclusive, right, cost is never going to come down if you want that to be done. Now, I, I would never want to see it go away either. I'm as big a love as what a man can, or a gal can do with their two hands and craft with their two hands. But the reality of it is, if you make a gun that way, okay, first of all, the ability to be able to do that is becoming much more limited. Second is 
that as cool as you think it is, it's unattainable for 99% of the people. Okay? That, that's the reality of it. A really nicely made, handmade gun, a bespoke gun, is going to start at, at 50, 60,000, go up, whatever it is. You know, I mean, a truly, for, yeah, I mean, how many people can afford to, to, to do that? Now, you can get secondhand versions of it. And secondhand guns from 80 years ago are beautiful in every way, but they are from, a, from an engineering and, and metallurgy and every other standpoint not superior to what you can make today, okay? And that, 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 that's, that's the reality of it. And so where, where, where do you, you know, you can kid yourself about it all you want, but where is it going in the future? Well, if you can't adapt to the lack of to skilled labor to be able to do that, okay, if you can't figure out through technology, just like everything else on this planet, if you can't figure out through technology how to accomplish the same task, you're going to be left without it. Plain and simple. There is no, there is no route around it, you know. And if you don't believe me, go immerse yourself in the people that are doing it. Giorgio will be glad to tell you that the companies who were there when we started, there's a lot of them are not there anymore. The name's still there. You might believe, as an expert, that they're still there. But... If you really want to know the story, there's nobody there. The doors are closed. You know, if you start up with a check tomorrow, they might put together a gun for you, but it's closed. It's gone. It's, we're losing it quickly. So the, the future is how can we take beautiful things that existed and try to attain it through an industrialized method? Okay. And, and, and at the end of the day, if you're wrapped up on the fact that somebody made it with a file or or made it with a CNC machine and the two things look almost identical, if you can make two things identical, hypothetically, and you're wrapped up on which way it goes, that, that's kind of illogical. And there is nobody that can hit a flat surface to one ten thousandth. So in essence, you can't do it, all right? You can't get to that level of precision by hand. And that's just true. I mean, our cars are not made by hand. Our computers are not made by hand. Our, you know, there's almost nothing that is made out of do we still rough hew timbers to make our houses? No. You know, that's because we've progressed. And I, 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 I know that doesn't sit well with some of the people that I'm probably talking to, you know. And I'm not trying to, to cast a judgment on it, to be honest with you. I'm just talking about a reality of, of, of if you really want to know the truth. Well, it's right. no, no secret that Holland and Holland and Purdy are both using CNC machines. Going to CNC, of course they, they have are. big computer labs and the whole deal. You can't do it. You can't do it without it. Yeah. You can't do it without it. All right? And you barely can do it in Italy in the valley. You know, and, and you want to know. George will tell you exactly. You want to quantify it in any way. You want to know. He'll be able to tell you what you want to know <laughs> when it comes to that kind of thing. But the positive side, okay, is if... You are clever with engineering and with technology, computer drafting and, 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 and CAD CAM and CNC and the rest of it. With the flexibility in machines today and the precision in machines today, we should be, with enough resources as human beings, be able to accomplish the same and exceed past that, okay, with the use of technology. Now, you might just dread the fact that it's not done with a, a, a soot lamp and a, and, and a file, but that's the, that's the reality, right? That's why, you know, we're, the, the planes you all flew in on weren't made by hand, right? So um, that's what our goal, when you talk about where our future is, okay? We, we're not in the business from day one. It would have been super simple, and, and, and you can talk to Georgia about it all the time. We could have created a company that made $100,000 shotguns. No problem. It's easy. Because it takes five, six, seven people. Maximum. Cost of investment is minimal. Giorgio's family makes some of the most, the Rosini side-by-sides are incredible. We can make a product like this. That's not the issue. The issue is that's not the future. 